I think finally after <laughs> many years of false starts that we figured out the proper stack to do that. In short, Bitcoin plus Lightning Network plus Noster. It was around 2021 and specifically going to the Bitcoin conference in Miami that was kind of me falling down the Bitcoin rabbit hole a second time. What really kind of persuaded me to, to, to pivot Arcade to Bitcoin uh, was a, a one-two punch. Number one, it was Jack Mallers' presentation about what all amazing circular networks and such that they had built. Started kind of thinking about, all right, like we can pivot Arcade to Lightning. You know, it, it was kind of tough to, to walk away from our shitcoin, <laughs> which we had, you know, it had been, you know, keeping us sort of afloat for, for a number of years. You know, I've been building the, the sort of Noster version of Arcade, not even building our own backend, just entirely throwing our requests to the Damas Relay. The highest form of network is actually a group forming network, which is when you start with a peer-to-peer -peer network. So you start with everyone can connect peer-to-peer -peer however they want, but it has the added property of making it as easy as possible for groups to form. Christopher David is the founder and CEO of Arcade City, a peer-to-peer -peer platform that aims to decentralize ride sharing and enable a circular Bitcoin economy. In our discussion, we covered Arcade City's vision. We discussed the challenges facing gig economy workers globally today. And we discussed why Arcade City is building this platform on Bitcoin, on Lightning, and on Noster, and why these tools are essential to bring this concept to life. Chris has asked to have his share of today's show splits sent to the Human Rights Foundation. So if you enjoy this show, and if you learn something new, the best way you can show your support is by sending in sats over the Lightning Network. I'm not gonna ask you for likes, I'm not gonna ask you for follows. This show runs on sats. So I appreciate all the sats and comments you guys send in over lightning. Just a quick message before we get into today's show. This episode is sponsored by Voltage. Voltage is the industry standard and next generation provider for lightning network infrastructure. Today's episode is also sponsored by Zebedee and Zebedee is your portal into the world of Bitcoin gaming. We'll have more from Voltage and Zebedee later in the show. Chris, thank you for taking the time to chat today. I am so excited to learn more about Arcade City because I've seen what you guys have, have put out in a couple blog posts, I've seen your site, and you have a, a huge vision. And so before we get into the, the discussion about exactly what you're building, I wanna step back and I wanna learn about you know, your background in Bitcoin, how you first discovered it, and why you decided to build on Lightning. Sure. So I got involved in Bitcoin um, a little bit back in 2011. Um, kind of was interested originally kind of through the Ron Paul scene. And one of my friends was talking about Bitcoin all the time. And, and when Bitcoin first spiked up to $30, I asked him, I was like, hey man, is Bitcoin gonna keep going up? And he's like, mm, eventually. So I bought a bunch of Bitcoin at 30 and then it crashed down to three. I'm like, ah, what the hell is this? <laughs> was still kind of interested in it as a as an experiment and a couple years later like oh my bitcoin's at two hundred dollars now so sold most of it and so thought i was cool at the time and then you know kicked myself hard over uh, uh since then um but i i you know been fascinated originally by bitcoin kind of from the austrian economics view ron paul talking about sound money and hey this might be something that if it takes off um could actually fulfill that um I was taken by the claims made by the founding team of Ethereum uh, in 2014, 2015, when they launched, in part because at the time I was driving full time for a few months for Uber. And so when the Ethereum was first launching and they gave this example of, hey, look, you know, Bitcoin's great for money, but we're using this blockchain technology, we're going to use the technology underlying Bitcoin to apply it to all these other areas, and it's going to enable us to build a world computer that can power decentralized applications. One of the key examples that they gave repeatedly, repeatedly, was this is going to be able to decentralize Uber. You don't need this big corporation taking 20% per ride. Now that resonated a lot with me as a driver because I was chafing against some of Uber's rules not even just the fares, but when I was driving, I had about 20% of my customers liked my service so much, they asked how they could request me again. 
Well, it's against Uber and Lyft's terms of service for you as a driver to exchange contact information with your rider and build up your own recurring customer base. They don't offer any support for that in the app, and if you get caught doing it outside of the app, you risk being deactivated. Now, to me, that put the lie to their whole marketing line about be your own boss, Uber said. And that got me thinking, like, maybe there's a rationale here to build a genuine alternative to Uber. Um, at the time, there was one other project that was trying to do something in the realm of decentralized ride sharing, a project called Lazuz out of Israel, ended up having some good conversations with the founders. They really never got past the um, you know, R&D prototype phase. They had a pretty interesting consensus algorithm they put forward. I think it was called proof of location, something like that. Um, but when we started Arcade City, the, the, it kind of grew out of this ban. So in New Hampshire, um, Uber got essentially banned. Uh, and so <clears throat> there was this like hilarious, um, event that happened where, uh, so I was in living in Portsmouth, New Hampshire at the time and driving for Uber there and in Boston. And at one point, uh, there's this festival, uh, in New Year's that happens and about 10,000 people come to this very small town, uh, for this New Year's celebration and the taxi cabs who everyone relied on for transportation because Uber by that point, about half of their driver base was eviscerated because they weren't driving because it was banned. So surge rates were like 9.9x, just crazy stuff. Well, the taxis were threatening to boycott that festival, which they did uh, a few months prior at Thanksgiving. They pull all their cabs over to the neighboring town and not serve anybody. So <clears throat> by this point, I had known about, I had built relationships with about 10 of the drivers um, uh, in the Portsmouth area who I'd gotten to know through certain of these activism campaigns I had done to raise awareness about this Uber ban. And it was looking to be this absolute nightmare shaping up with the taxis and the Uber not being able to see eye to eye with the, the local government. It was just a, a bad situation. Uh, and so I put up a really quick website. I was like, you know, let's take some ride reservations. Let's just organize some peer to peer rides and let's, let's actually see if we can provide a service here. Turns out it was a complete nightmare. There were people, for example, at 2 a.m. walking home a mile, like walking to their hotel a mile and a half from downtown to their hotel at 2 a.m. in a New Hampshire winter, snow and ice on the ground. You know, eventually after we did our pre-scheduled rides, we had our little 10 drivers kind of fan out and offer rides to these people. And, you know, we took, a, took the edge off of a really bad situation. So we kind of got, got some press coverage out of that and, and you know, that began the story of, of Arcade City as its own entity. We did not begin sort of as this theoretical science project of we're going to write a white paper. It began as we identify a real need here, which is there's corporations and governments fighting each other over regulations. Um, they can't solve the need of providing reliable service to people who need it. Um, and when that happens, people get screwed. And my argument is if you enable more peer-to-peer -peer networks um, that don't need to care or they can kind of get around some of these um, uh, onerous regulations, um, that's what's going to be needed to have reliable service be provided. And that, that was sort of the genesis of Arcade City. Interesting. So for me, Arcade City is new. I just saw it pop up recently in the Lightning community. But how long has this been from, from inception in New Hampshire to today? How long have you been working on the project? On and off for, I mean, since 2016, um, the main success story has been our Austin network. Um, and, and again, we, it was only in the last year that we've been kind of pivoting to Bitcoin and the Lightning Network, and, and that's a whole story I'm happy to tell. But the, the main uh, kind of foundational event for us uh, was in May of 2016 when Uber and Lyft announced that they were going to be suspending service in Austin in 48 hours, walking away from their eighth largest market in the U.S. and putting 10,000 drivers out of a job. Now, that, by that point, we had uh, built a little bit of a network in New Hampshire. We had launched a very basic mobile app for Android and iOS. We had had rides given by a few people in 28 states and Australia and gotten some you know, inbound coverage and drivers really loving the idea of, hey, I can actually build my own customer base. I can set my own pricing. 
And so when the Austin situation happened, it was kind of cool because by that point, Uber had pulled out of a number of cities around Texas. They pulled out of Midlands. They pulled out of Corpus Christi. And in some of these areas, we had these arcade city organizers build their own networks to kind of take advantage of this void. And at the time, so we, we, we had our app live from maybe like February to April of 2016. We took it down because at that point we were vetting all drivers centrally and we just kind of had a big growth spike. We're like, all right, we need to like figure out how to better decentralize this model. And so when the April, the May situation happened, our app was out of the app store, but we had in areas like Midland, Texas, these little groups running on Facebook where one driver, one Arcade City driver would create a group called Arcade City Midland Request a Ride and would have a team of former Uber drivers kind of folded in and providing requests to people. In Midland, Texas, they got on the news, you know, great local TV coverage of, hey, there's a Facebook group where people are offering rides in the aftermath of Uber pulling out. And they showcase our drivers doing this, this amazing teamwork where, you know, a team of about seven drivers and they would kind of trade requests back and forth to make sure that all the requests were covered. And that grew up to about 400 or 500 people, mostly riders, uh, in some of these smaller Texas cities. And so when we got the Austin news, I w went to the organizer of our, our Midland group, Eric. I said, listen, man, we need to do this for Austin until we get the next version of our app out. You make the group, we'll promote the hell out of it, and let's, let's do this again, but in big scale, on big scale in Austin. Um, we did that. That network, that group grew up to about 10,000 people in the first week. Um, I came to Austin intending to be here for two weeks or so to help launch the network, ended up falling in love with the city and, and, and moving here and moving my family here. Um, but just some of the, the amazing, first of all, some of the like nightmare scenes repeated, kind of like we experienced in New Hampshire um, on, in Austin on 6th Street, for example, which is the big kind of like um, bar party scene. In that first week when Uber and Lyft were gone and the taxis were, you know, you couldn't get a taxi, it was just too, too stressed. There were people literally going up to car windows, like on the street, banging on them, like waving cash in the window. Can you take me? So we had drivers act like we were the only, you know, ride share active in that first um, week. So again, helping to kind of take the edge off. So Arcade City was about, we were the first of about 10 different projects, mostly companies, one nonprofit that formed in Austin over the next couple of months after that trying to fill this void left behind by Uber and Lyft. They ended up coming back about a year later after they overrode at the state level some of the local le regulations that they, they pulled out originally in protest to. Um, but it's just been fascinating to watch, you know, in that first year, you know, a few of those companies died off. Most of them died off in the couple years after Uber came back. The last one died off in uh, about a year ago, Ride Austin, just citing like COVID things. And so of all of the 10 <laughs> projects that came to Austin, they're all dead now, except for Arcade City. We've just got this really small but persistent network of about, it varies between 100 to 150 drivers. There's a Facebook group of about 30,000 people. And it's, you know, the, the network activity has died down mostly in the last year, largely due to COVID and people doing other things. But the fact that we've had a network on a shoestring budget be able to provide reliable transportation and deliveries every day for five years has been just really remarkable. And it's shown me that, look, we've discovered something beautiful here, which is we've kind of cracked the nut of how you actually provide decentralized services, as in peer-to-peer -peer services without some massive corporation, reliably on a shoestring budget and able to have answers for things like how you do you know, safety and vetting and all the kinds of things that you would expect from a modern ride-sharing service, but to do it in a, in a more community-driven way. My short answer to how that, that actually works, it's, it's not actually 100% peer-to-peer as people might think like, oh, there's just like a rider and a driver and they meet on a blockchain or something or on a website, it, it really is community driven. Uh, we had in those early days, this sort of leadership team emerge of some of the top drivers themselves who might have built their own teams of seven to 10 drivers and who in those early days, we very quickly kind of gave them sort of formal control over the network. Our request to them was, look, write a charter spelling out what your policies are 
for how you onboard new drivers to the network, how you handle rider disputes, how, what you charge for payments. They decided to kind of set one rate universally that would get changed during special events or whatever. Um, but be transparent about how you're governing the network and then you know, govern the network according to that. Um, and that charter, you know, that charter is something that's online. I'm happy to link to anybody, but that, that's been sort of the governing charter of this group for five years. There have been rotations in and out of the leadership team and such. But, uh, you know, we've shown that this model, which we call a cooperative driven model, cooperative ride sharing, it works and works to the point where we've had organizations like, for example, this uh, think tank based in Oakland, California, uh, the Sustainable Economies Law Center. They got a, a they funded a paid grant with a paid grant a research study. They sent researchers to Austin to interview our drivers, interview me, and they wrote a 110 page case study on our Austin network as an example of what they call platform cooperativism, leveraging sort of old techniques of you could call it labor organizing, but you know service providers providing service themselves minus a corporation, leveraging some of the newer technologies. In this case, the technologies being used were largely Facebook and kind of word of mouth, peer to peer texting and, and basic messaging services, which we have, you know, my, I, I viewed my task as sort of the corporate level is, you know, I want to build a platform that can encapsulate the magic of our Austin network and export it to the world. Um, I think finally, after <laughs> many years of false starts, that we figured out the proper stack to do that. In short, Bitcoin plus Lightning Network plus Noster plus our gorgeous mobile app that we've you know refined over the years, uh, which we're now in the process of, of beta testing and putting out to the world. We've had some successes, kind of launching our our um, this model via the app into other areas like the Philippines. But the, the name of the game has really been how do we bottle up the magic of our Austin network and export it to the world properly integrating, you know, blockchain technology, AKA Bitcoin. Mm. Now, how did you decide, you know, you mentioned the tech stack there, Bitcoin, Lightning, Noster, and your app. How did you get from, from where you are today, or sorry, how did you get from, from your initial starting point five or six years ago to where you are today? What was the process like in determining what the correct tech stack should be for an app like this? Yeah. So from the beginning, our emphasis has been on getting um, like product live and into users' hands. Um, so in the beginning, it was just put out a simple, you know, in 2016, it was an Ionic app and then React Native app, just a really simple, even if it's client server, not get fancy about like token or weird blockchain stuff. So get a product out. In 2016, you know, our, our, our focus in 2016 was on Ethereum. And this is largely just because that was the only real like, major quote unquote decentralized application focused blockchain at the time. Um, and that's where all the excitement was. That was even like before the, the ICO days. Um, but, but the thinking was, yeah, like here's a way for us to write code and put it onto a blockchain that can run by itself. And we don't need to worry about censorship and people can, you know, adapt it in, in, in ways that they want to. Um, we spun our wheels with that. We just had some bad experiences, not even so much technologically, but just culturally and organizationally. The, the first team, of, there's like a group of Ethereum developers in Europe that reached out to us in 2016, like, hey, you know, we can help you build the Ethereum part of your app. And like, they joined our team. We added like some Ethereum community heavyweights as advisors, like Vitalik's dad joined as an advisor to Arcade City. But this was all in the context of like us doing a token sale and the developers wanted to do the token sale sooner than later. And long story short, and this is maybe worth, worthy of a long, longer conversation, but like they stole our funding. We, we raised 600K worth of Ether uh, in uh, November of 2016 or so. Um, there was just some drama. They took the money and they walked off with it and they started their own project to compete with Arcade. There's a, a, all sorts of drama with that. Um, so our, our, our first, you know, um, attempt to meaningfully integrate Ethereum was just like the developers walked off and they thought that they had all of this support from the Ethereum, you know, leadership that were their friends. Um, and so they, they fucked us out of what became millions of dollars worth of Ether, which then got stolen from them in this, in the, the parody hack of, of 2017, just, just a, a, a massive clusterfuck. Okay. 
2017, end of 2017, we tried again, you know, issued another token. We're saying, okay, if you're still holding our old token, you can convert it in. Um, um, around that time, that was like, you know, 2017, 2018, the market started heating up. Transaction fees started getting, getting crazy to the point where, you know, you, you can't really reason about building a token or any meaningful Ethereum integration into an app if it's going to cost you multiple dollars per interaction. So or particularly around 2017, 2018, the, the focus of the Ethereum community, like no one was talking about decentralized Uber, uh, like from the, the like official team angle. There were a bunch of um, kind of scammy ICOs. We lost count at about 20 of these projects that put up websites and they said, oh, we're going to build decentralized ride sharing on Ethereum and here's our white paper and here's our website, pay us money. Um, none of those projects reached out to the only like successful network that actually had riders and drivers active uh, who were also trying to integrate with Ethereum. Um, and the, the focus of the chain clearly became around, you know, this kind of shift toward DeFi and, and being okay with these really high transaction fees, which made like usage of consumer focused applications that would require really small dollar transactions just essentially impossible. And that was back when, you know, people were starting to think about layer twos um, as a solution to some of that. I remember some Ethereum meetup I went to in like 2018 where they had some guy from Prismatic, one of the like companies working on Ethereum scalability. And they were talking about certain like layer two thing or ETH2 things that they were excited were going to, there was going to, they were going to come out in the next few months. And I remember this like closed door, like private, like crypto investor salon and people were pressing this, this guy from one of these, you know, firms working on scalability. They're like, no, really like six months. Come on. How long do you think this is going to take? And the guy's like, you know, I think some of these things could take two years. Like that was four years ago, five years ago. Ethereum has had no answer for companies like mine who want to meaningfully integrate chains that are actually putting, you know, useful, usable apps into people, into people's hands. Um, so, you know, went through evaluating some other chains, you know, Solana, Holochain, um, uh, the Telegram chain, I got excited about that. Um, it was around 2021 and specifically going to the Bitcoin conference in Miami that was kind of me falling down the Bitcoin rabbit hole a second time. Um, and and f what what kind of persuaded me, because I've been keeping my eye on the Lightning Network and this, and this seemed kind of promising over the last few years, just watching it develop. And f what really kind of persuaded me to, to, to pivot Arcade to Bitcoin uh, was a, a, a one-two punch. Number one, it was Jack Mallers' presentation about what all amazing circular networks and such that they had built in El Salvador. Like, oh, wow, here are people actually building networks where they're being meaningfully organized in communities that need it. These are not people focused on, you know, making the crypto rich richer or, or arbitrary virtual worlds or, or shit coins. It's like, how do we provide value for people's lives? And to do that in a really successful way on a small scale that then gets scaled up to the level of a, a country and now Bitcoin is legal tender. Like that was hugely inspiring to me and also demonstrating, oh wow, the Lightning Network actually can and is working in production on a massive you know, scale at, at the level of a country. Uh, it was that in, in combination with a, a, an excellent talk that I, I recommend people watch um, uh, that's on YouTube called, uh, I think it was called The Bitcoin Stack. Uh, Ryan Gentry and Drew Bensall gave a talk and, and they started off the talk. It was like, Ryan said something like, I'm tired of people saying that they can't build their, their use case on Bitcoin and they need to use a shitcoin for it. And, and they gave just this, this excellent presentation about the state of Bitcoin now and, you know, the different layers and what's being built out, but, but demonstrating that all, so, so, so many of the use cases that the crypto community, the altcoin, shitcoin people have been talking about are things that it will be built in the Bitcoin or the broader Bitcoin ecosystem, but in layers on top of Bitcoin. That started getting my head turning around like, okay, if, if the Arcade City use case can be built on Lightning or on Bitcoin, I want to. 
But the question has been one of timing. Is this something that I, as a developer with limited resources, can go and meaningfully integrate now? Um, you know, the, the short answer was, okay, we can start with payments, which is like a huge thing anyways. Uh, and one, one of the ideas that I had fallen in love with um, earlier on years ago, listening to Andreas Antonopoulos talking about streaming money, this idea of instead of you being paid via a paycheck once every two weeks from an employer, being able to have Bitcoin via the Lightning Network streamed to you instantly, um, it's gonna, just going to be a massive you know, user experience upgrade compared to the fiat system. And I could very clearly visualize having that applied to rideshare, where instead of, so in the US, some of the drivers are a little spoiled because the integration with the payment processors, you can usually hit the button to like pay X percent to get paid out to your debit card immediately. But in, in plenty of countries around the world, it's, it's not the case. You actually have to wait and you get paid once a week. So one of the arguments that I'm, I've been making recently is like, hey, how about instead of being paid once per week, you're able to be paid instantly during the ride, streaming the SaaS directly from rider to driver um, as one benefit that is like very clear, non-speculative, very easy to implement that currently on Lightning Network. Um, so started kind of thinking about, all right, like we can pivot Arcade to Lightning. You know, it, it was kind of tough to, to walk away from our shitcoin, <laughs> which we had, you know, it had been, you know, keeping us sort of afloat for, for a number of years. Um, but it, the, the further I fell back down the Bitcoin rabbit hole and I'm like, oh, actually I'm recognizing how poisonous the incentives of having the shitcoin are, including specifically to projects like mine, where, you know, we went through, through, through phases where, um, you know, our incentive was not to release a working product that people derive value from. It was to support the price of our tokens so that we can, you know, have more cash and run away ourselves and have our token speculators be excited. You know, fortunately, we never got too deep into that world. I've always, people would ask us like, when will you list on this exchange or when will you do more marketing? I've always resisted doing that. I've said, look, when we release a product that has a meaningful integration of this token, then it'll market itself and like maybe then we'll do more like putting it on exchanges and and so so fortunately it was actually somewhat easy to walk away from the token because we just never had it like listed anywhere and you know letting people if they want to convert tokens that they're holding into our you know standard investment instrument safe notes so that 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 that's fine um but then my my eyes have in just in the last six to nine months been opened by oh okay so there's now about four projects that are trying to solve also kind of decentralized application or decentralized data layers uh, adjacent to or anchored to Bitcoin. And so, you know, putting on my, my you know, nerd architecture hat, you know, participating in, in various Bitcoin hackathons over the last year, I've been trying to wrap my head around what's possible and which ones we should be focusing on. So the, the four, for, for those who don't know, and, and there might be more that, that I'm, I'm not aware of. Um, so you've got the, the Web5, which has been recently announced uh, from Block or recently coined as Web5. Uh, they've been working on that for a while, um, which I first learned about from reading the TBDEX white paper. But you know, the combination of decentralized identifiers plus verifiable credentials plus formerly called identity hubs, now called decentralized web nodes, kind of the shorthand for all of that they're calling Web5. Um, that's very promising and one approach toward building a data layer where you know applications don't need to rely on you know fanciful blockchains and a lot of those use cases can be done in this way that's that's anchored to Bitcoin in the right way but without stuffing a bunch of crap uh, and, and the base chain so so that that's one uh, synonym and the slash tags and kind of affiliate with the the, the tether ecosystem and the, they just did their keep hole punch release uh, announcement a couple days ago. That's another approach. They're making some, you know, different architectural decisions than the Web5 folks. There are some important overlaps. That's another approach. There's a, a, a group, I think the LNBBP Foundation or Association, whatever. Uh, they've got RGB that they're working on. And I haven't looked at it too closely, but a couple weeks ago, they put out some um, storm, some, some protocol for doing uh, encrypted messaging and using Lightning as a transport layer. Um, uh, and, and then you've got Noster, uh, which is uh, the fourth one. And, you know, most interesting to me is that the, the first three that I mentioned kind of have these um, 
you know, larger organizations backing them. And Noster is, is from what I can tell, an entirely grassroots uh, phenomenon led by developers. You know, the founder Fiat Joff with the, you know, involved with the LNURL spec. And you just got a lot of the kind of like lightning hackers and lightning builders um, who've settled on this like dirt simple protocol for getting data passed around in a decentralized way, but not quote unquote peer to peer way. And, and that's one of the things that I've been wrapping my head around is like the difference between decentralized and peer to peer. And for, so for, for example, for something like, like a ride sharing app, do we need every transaction to be entirely quote unquote peer to peer as in having devices talk directly to each other or using some of the like more arcane, um, you know, protocols for peer to peer communication, or is it fine to have them both connect to a relay, which could be, you know, like a, a really lightweight server that could be run by the guild leader or like the, the local like organizer, the local tech person, or some, you know, a company will run our own relays, but give them the choice of like, if you're in Iran, for example, like you should have some local relay that you can connect to and not need to worry about app store regulations banning you or whatever. Um, Nostr works for all of that. And, and I love in your, your chat with William talking about the Chinese dissidents who were using Nostr. Like, yes, like the, the, the vision of peer to peer connectivity for services and communication is not and should not be limited to, you know, spoiled US consumers. <laughs> we do not want to be transportation option number 10 for people in Silicon Valley or even Austin. Like I, I, I care a lot more about the developing world um, you know, have loved launching in the Philippines. Our biggest interested market is in Brazil. These are areas that may have been, you know, and particularly across Latin America and Africa, these are areas that may have been, um, you know, ignored or overlooked by larger corporations where now it's as flexible as, hey, like one of your people can spin up a Nostra relay or use ours to start. Here's the app, it's open source. You can download it from the app store or use it on the web app if it's not available in your country. And everyone is now able to compete on a level, like, like participate on a level playing field. Everyone's already able to participate um, in the open monetary network of Bitcoin. Uh, so all of these kind of, um, uh, you know, there's an increasing number of applications that are kind of speaking the same language, uh, built in interoperability around payments. Well, now thanks to protocols like Noster, we can now also start speaking the same language of data. So for example, um, you know, William's application Damas, you know, I've been building the, the sort of Noster version of Arcade, not even building our own backend, just entirely throwing our requests to the Damas relay, which means they show up, uh, the messages that people send from the Arcade app show up in Damas and vice versa. Uh, really powerful interoperability. I'll pause here for a breath and you can ask me a question. <laughs> I hope you're enjoying the show so far. I just want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, Voltage. Voltage is the industry standard for Lightning Network infrastructure. Creating layer two applications and services on top of Bitcoin starts with Voltage, where you can spin up nodes, get access to liquidity, optimize your node, and much more. Voltage is leading the way as the next generation provider of Lightning Network infrastructure. And if you want to get a free trial and start using Voltage today, you can do so at voltage.cloud. That's really fascinating. Yeah, I, I, I think you got those four uh, messaging apps that are kind of like peer to peer or decentralized. One other one is uh, Sphinx as well. Um, but it's interesting that you've chosen to go with uh, Noster. And I want to make sure I have an understanding of like how the how the overall app works now, right? Like it's payments on Lightning when you're paying a driver um, for a ride. It's communicating with that driver through Noster. And what's what's the discoverability like? Like when I go to, you know, one of the one of the benefits you get from a centralized app is when I show up on Uber, all the drivers are there, and I just, you know, I don't have to find them. I don't have to discover them. They're all in this one hub. How do you solve for that? in a decentralized system. Yeah, so in the beginning, and, and this is a little bit kind of challenges that we're wrestling with in the next few weeks in preparation for our launch in August, but our, our answer to that for the August launch is we're going to maintain one kind of fat arcade relay that all um, client apps, all the apps downloaded from the arcade app store are gonna start by connecting to our relay. 
And so we know that all of the requests will be sort of, you know, exposed into in that one relay. Um, we want to enable people to kind of add other relays, but the initial experience, you know, we want to start by optimizing for the, the first user who's non-technical, doesn't want to have to even learn about what a relay is. Um, all, all it's going to do is it's going to show, you know, you're going to share your location to the app as any rideshare app would, and we can show you a list of any requests that are near you. Um, so, we, you know, it, it's, it's very simple to do that via geolocation. There are some interesting um, security considerations given that, you know, we're talking about people's, um, you know, user locations and how do we send that out to an open network in a way that is secure and not leaking user data. And there's you know, a couple of different answers there around, you know, encrypting certain of that data as well as, uh, so for example, one of the conversations uh, in the Noster Telegram channel where we're kind of brainstorming some of this stuff just over the last couple of days, um, someone noted that there is uh, this like geo-hashing um, algorithm that Uber developed and has then been open sourced for representing user locations at whatever Zoom level as like, as like a hash. So if you want to share someone's approximate location, so let, let's say that someone wants to put out a, a, a public ride request it you know it's intended for people close to you, but it's on the public network, so maybe it's accessible to a bunch of people. But you can give very approximate locations, and then maybe once there's like a, an exchange of rider chooses driver, there's an exchange of um, keys, kind of like uh, in Nostr. We already have the protocol for encrypted DMs, in which you know some of the more precise locations can be shared at that time. Um, and so we've got sort of parallel development going on right now, where I'm focused on kind of the the rideshare app UX, uh, and we've got a uh, super test net, one of the like Noster, uh, LM bits developers. Um, he, he just, and part of what kind of gave us the kick in the ass to, to integrate with Noster sooner than later, uh, was super, who, who's another kind of Austin area, um, a Bitcoin lightning developer. He, he just on a hackathon, you know, style lark a week ago was like, Hey, like, I wonder if I can do a, a, a proof of concept for you know rideshare with uh, with Noster, and he built this thing called Bull Run, basically a, a basic protocol for how to tie in you know lightning payments and, and just like an initial flow for how this all can and should use Noster with this new Noster event type. Um, and he wrote that into a spec, and he you know sent it to me, and he was like, "Hey, do you want to involve you know fold this into Arcade City?" I said, "Yes, let's do it right now." Um, and so you know over the last week and people can like kind of follow the progress as we're like kind of building in, in public on uh, sharing all our stuff on Twitter. But I've been able to show like the the ride requests that this demo app that Super built a week ago, he has those being sent, like he didn't write a backend, he's sending those all to the Domus relay. Uh, and so I'm able to very quickly write a client that, you know, connects via WebSockets to the Domus relay, pulls all of those ride requests into the arcade app, which we can visualize in cool ways. The demo I put out yesterday kind of showed our, you know, beautiful 3D map kind of zooming from the start to finish location, cycling through a bunch of these requests from Nostra. But so we, we now have this, is basically this universal request feed where any, any client app can pull in requests and do interesting things with. So now, now it's basically just about what is the business logic of, of so to, to, to kind of to answer your questions about discoverability. The, the idea is that the UI UX should feel as similar to people that are accustomed to using Uber and Lyft. We want to offer them almost the exact same experience uh, where you just open the app, you put in your ride request, that gets sent to drivers near you. Um, and, you know, it, it's still an open question as to what the exact flow should be that's going to work in the in the beginning before we have like larger driver networks built up and we'll be able to do some beta testing in Austin with our like existing driver base. But, um, you know, so w w one idea is to just like let people kind of bid. And so you can attach, uh, uh some stats to a, a ride request. And then, you know, if someone cares enough to respond, they can just see it. Um, so the, the, the discoverability I think is, is pretty, pretty easily answered by, um, we're able to set really whatever business logic we want. There's nothing really opinionated about um, Noster. It's, it's, it's got this philosophy of um, dumb relays, smart clients. So the relay is just going to kind of be a way for data to be accessible to clients who want it. 
and the clients can kind of specify their own logic for what events, what type of data they want to store and then how they want to retrieve it. Makes sense. Um, okay, so I want to get into the specifics of, of the app right now. I, I think you mentioned there's 100 or 150 drivers using the app today. Are they using this, this relay system now? Are they using Noster and are they using Lightning payments today, those 150? No, no the Austin drivers that have been active have been all, always on our Facebook group. And it's, it's been fascinating to watch as we've released successive app versions over the last few years. You know, we've always kind of beta tested with the Austin network and they've never adopted it en masse. And, and this is in part, we realized after the fact and, and talking to people is like, what actually makes the Austin network tick um, is heavy reliance on messaging. And so, for example, the, the Austin network, there's the like 30,000 person public or semi-public uh, group, which is like sort of the main request feed. There's a private group of the drivers, 100 to 150 drivers in there. Uh, there's a bunch of like private messenger, Facebook messenger chains where, for example, all of the drivers who are in North Austin will be in one chain. And so if there's a request that comes in that one person can't take, they'll tag each other. There's all sorts of just this like organic grassroots organization that relies on really low friction messaging and the network effect of all of the drivers just being on that one messenger. And so this was like an important lesson to us as you know, the apps that we've put out, we've modeled them on Uber and Lyft's UX, and that's just not how our Austin network has worked. And so this is, you know, one thing that I've been, you know, the, the, my, my lesson that I really internalized about a year ago was before we do all sorts of cool things at the level of the ride requests to actually have the network work in practice, we actually have to solve decentralized social first as well. Um, I, I did a, a hackathon in December uh, in Houston, and I, I gave a whole presentation about the potential of Bitcoin and Lightning as applied to social networks. And I'm very familiar with, with Sphinx Chat, like you mentioned, but I, I actually, in that um, uh, presentation, which is, which is online, people can, can look for, is um, I contrasted the Sphinx model to the Noster model um, and argued that, you know, if you're requiring, and I, I don't know what Sphinx's current plans are, but I know at the time it was sort of every user had to have their own LND node. And I thought that that was a bit of a barrier. Um, and you know, if you have to charge people for that, you know, the ideal situation is that someone can just join and participate immediately and not need to worry about that. I think that there's really cool possibilities by op leveraging some of the uh, sort of custodial or semi-custodial tooling that's out there. LND Hub being one example, the what powers Blue Wallet and, and LN Bits is kind of an example of this where you can have one sort of more savvy operator or it's a company run a node, run a multi-user account system. And so people are able to transact easily via Lightning. And so just to skip forward, like that's, that's what we're launching with right now is, is our Lightning integration. We use Voltage. Voltage has a, a new kind of a dashboard or integration that they launched recently with LN Bits. So we just you know very easily spun up an LN Bits instance, and so all of the you know, one of the beta builds we tested a few weeks ago was um, you know just basically people tr transacting back and forth um, uh, easily in the app via LN Bits, able to like withdraw to their own uh, uh, networks uh, to their own wallets if they want to. But but in that in that kind of social presentation, I made the argument that um, Nostra actually makes a lot of sense if you're talking about a protocol that can power something like decentralized social media. And one of my arguments is that, you know, you want the interoperability, interoperability to be as lightweight as possible so that different people with different financial incentives can provide relays. And not that all relays also need to speak the exact same language. So in the example I gave was, um, so the, the, the uh, Keats uh, app, for example, uh, they use a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, software or protocol called Hypercore. It, it's kind of a competitor to IPFS, so you can kind of think of it in that way. But that it, it's, it's, a, it's a very different idea than Noster, where in Noster, the relays do not talk to each other, uh, whereas the you know people running Hypercore, they do talk to each other. And my argument is that, look, you can have both 
uh, both architectures coexist in the same model. There could be a set of node operators that maybe they want to run some servers that speak Noster and they speak the Noster protocol. But maybe they also speak to, there's like a cluster of nodes that they work together. There's some, for example, uh, a, a unique data persistence that they want to do. So instead of relying on one, um, and or, or maybe there's uh, an impervious node, you know, impervious. And I know they're now doing their browser, but at the time it was like, you know, they've got this, this Node.js wrapper on top of LND that exposes certain functionality and like, all of these can be united in, in one um, marketplace. So the, the, my, my, my argument there was that, you know, if we're talking about decentralized social, um, we should not be thinking in terms of these massive, um, like, like single monolithic layer one chains. Like I started that presentation kind of making fun of this like DSO, decentralized social, like, shitcoin chain that just raised a bunch of money from Andreessen Horowitz and they were gonna they were gonna build the 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 layer that's gonna store all this social data on this chain and and I, I, I I'm just not convinced of the technical necessity of any of those chains when we are able to solve a lot of that by just having appropriate market incentives and having you know node operators like let, let, there could be a, a Noster node type uh, that specializes in, in, in media handling. And if you want to, maybe they charge you five sats per, you know, X number of kilobytes uh, to store media, and maybe they have certain persistence guarantees. But but we, we need to be thinking about things like decentralized social as uh, kind of joint projects uh, that the Bitcoin community can reason about as its own sort of layer. Uh, so I think there should be a, a, a social layer that multiple projects uh, uh, connect to. On top of that social layer should be uh, decentralized services. Um, and so it's, it's just been really amazing to see from, from essentially day one how easy it is to have multiple apps that speak the same language, in this case Noster. It, it'll be interesting to see to what extent others of these sort of competing architectures whether it's Web5 or the, the synonym stuff or RGB are able to also kind of talk with each other and, and hopefully we're not all building these own siloed architectures. Um, but, but you know, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that there's going to be at least some degree of convergence between these architectures where we can really be kind of putting our heads together collectively about like, what does it mean? Like, what should the Bitcoin social layer look like? What should the Bitcoin services layer look like? Uh, but with a real eye toward focusing on use cases. Ours in this case is, you know, decentralized Uber, decentralized rideshare, and, and largely just because, you know, that's, that's where I've got six years of experience with. That's what we're best positioned to, um, you know, lead on in terms of um, a use case. But I'm, I'm really excited about the potential to solve problems around, you know, whether it's identity or, or authentication, uh, um, uh, you know, payments, uh, and then to make it easy for other projects to uh, use those same solutions. So, for example, in New Hampshire, when we were first starting out, I had one guy say, hey, you know, I love this idea. I would love to do um, a project that is like peer-to-peer -peer snow plow reservation and use the same concepts so that there could be a little market and people transact with each other peer-to-peer. -peer. Now, what would a shitcoiner tell him to do? Oh, cool, man. Make peer-to-peer snow plow coin and like do an ICO or like like – he, he's not going to raise venture money to, to build a platform for an idea that is regional and seasonal. Um, so that, that's, that sort of Uber for X model that got everyone excited years ago, I, I, think, that, I think we're going to increasingly see that be replaced by one overarching network of networks that solves these problems and then you know at kind of like a, a, a lower base layer – and then let's application developers who want to say, look, you know, I'm going to build the the peer-to-peer -peer snowplow interface and spin up a website, um, you know, in in a day, and and focus on the use case, focus on the, the the value proposition to the customer, and know that they can plug into Bitcoin and Lightning for payments and Noster or whatever else for data, and you know, maybe there's something that Arcade provides that makes it easier in terms of you know reputation or, or social things that we're we're solving, but. Um, you know, not having everyone replicate their own L1 chain, like that just doesn't make any sense. Right. 
Yeah, I think Bitcoiners have taken this, uh, the right approach, have taken the high road on building the store of value layer, the payments layer, and now we're seeing social layer and application layer. Um, and, you know, sometimes these things take longer than, than we expect, and sometimes they don't get the adoption that we think they might. Uh, I, think, I think the common criticism you'd hear from the crypto folks to play devil's advocate is like, well, you know, this stuff hasn't, hasn't been adopted as quickly. And I see that point. I see, you know, I see both sides of the issue here. Um, I want to play devil's advocate, though, on the idea of scaling this up to the point where it is a, you know, Uber or Lyft competitor. Like we can use Arcade City as an example. Like, how do we get to the point where people are transacting on Lightning and, uh, you know, using this decentralized social system to interact with each other? Um, at a time where we, we already have the, you know, uh, full global distribution of Uber and Lyft, and we have the full global distribution of social apps, it, it's going to be, a, I think it's going to be a harder, you know, it's, it's a lot harder to sell the idea of decentralized social when there are already existing social platforms, right? They've already got a market share. And so how do we then get to the point where we can, you know, we have to be 10x better on some some level, right? We have to, in order to disrupt this group of social apps and ride-sharing apps, we need to have a system that is clearly better for everyone. What's your pitch to the to the person walking down the street who asks, why do I need this? Why, why can't I just use Uber? Why can't I just, you know, use Facebook to chat with my friends? I'll start with, with ride-share. Um... If the person's walking down the streets of Manila in the Philippines, which has the densest traffic in the world, uh, Uber is not available there. Uber sold their entire Southeast Asian operation to the local competitor called Grab. And Grab, for years, has had a, essentially monopoly uh, with all of these insane supply like caps from the government that they have to deal with. There have been like people like trying to, to, to sign up that couldn't, uh, all sorts of like just BS regulations and hoops. So there's a level of like, if we're just providing a service, um, uh, particularly, and, and you know, forget, forget even Philippines for a second, go to an area like Uber's, Uber's not everywhere. Uh, Uber is, is, uh, does not at all uh, serve many rural areas, in fact, yeah, One of the first uh, people who, who, who you know, started an arcade network in the U.S. was in rural Iowa, and he was able – he asked us early on. He was like, hey, can I print up you know, business cards and put you know, Arcade City Iowa on it? We're like, absolutely. And with, with no marketing support, no support of any kind aside from us cheering him on, went into bars, drummed up local business – uh, you know, asked people if they needed rides home, built up a clientele, got so busy that he recruited seven other drivers, got on the local you know, news, and a newspaper headline wrote uh, – the, the headline was, Arcade City brings ride share to the Cedar Valley before Uber. Like that's priceless. And, I, and, and here's the cool thing. I guarantee you there is one of that person, that type of person, in every city in every rural area around the world. So I would want to start by, and even if it's, let's just say, for example, we're focusing on the bottom billion or bottom two billion of folks, um, empowering people where they actually, like this kind of thing would make a lot of difference for them. And look, it might look way different in different areas. It might not be, oh, I need a grub, you know, I need someone to give me a cup of coffee from the street down the road. It might be like, you know, take this set of farmed goods from one area to the next. Um, there's areas like Puerto Rico, for example, where Uber is really big in San Juan, um, and you can get from San Juan to other places on the island, but you've got an island of 3 million people, a lot of them in, in the, 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 the countryside, who cannot reliably get from the countryside to the city, or, you know, we, we did a, a survey a couple years ago just asking people on the island, like, what were their complaints about transportation, and, like, reliable city-to-city -city transportation um, outside of San Juan was a, a, like a, a big thing. So just by being there and having the same things kind of available uh, is going to make a big difference. I, I think there's um, – so on, on the user experience side, so first of all, for the driver, um, our drivers in Austin have built their own recurring customer base. 
They make some of them two to three times the money that they made with the other services. It's all on their own terms. No one can fire them. Uh, you know, three three years after I had that experience of not having my own customer base, you know, I talked with one of our Austin drivers, and he's got his next two weeks booked of pre-scheduled rides of his regulars who pay him better anyways. It's a level of job security and stability. No rideshare company in the world is even structurally capable of matching. You add to that some of the like friction in the last couple of years with the COVID limitations. As an example, I got into a car in Miami, the Lyft driver, as I'm getting in, I, I didn't wear a mask, but as, as I'm getting in the car, he starts putting on a mask and I'm like, hey man, I don't care. Like don't put one on because of me. He says, oh no, the Lyft app will take screenshots of him every so often. And if he's not wearing a mask, he'll get penalized and potentially deactivated. Like, I think that's completely fucked up for a company to be basically intervening in health decisions like that. Now, the answer to that is not no one can wear masks. The answer is you empower drivers to make their own decisions. There might be a driver who wants to wear a hazmat suit and require all of his riders to wear a hazmat suit. And he should have the ability to market that as its own service and let it compete on the open market. And if people want to do fist bumps and hugs when you get into the car, like people should be able to specialize in that. We've seen in Austin, when you empower people to be entrepreneurial, you get levels of service provided that the corporates don't do. Early on in Arcade, one of the like team leaders, the, the kind of driver leaders earlier on, uh, she had the idea to create a, what we then called pod, like a, a, a her own sort of kind of sub team of drivers, all female drivers. And now, you know, in the intervening years that have, there have been other startups that have been like, tried to portray that as a new idea. And like, we're going to have people be able to choose the gender of their, their drivers, but completely organically without any corporate involvement, we're able to now solve a use case called a young lady is getting out of the club at 2 AM, doesn't want to roll the dice to see if Uber's algorithm pairs her with a creeper who now knows where she lives, which is something that Uber and Lyft have had trouble with. Um, you're just empowering people to make decisions like that. We've had people say, hey, I've got access to a military base. I'd like to provide custom service for military members. We've had people say they want to provide custom support to the handicapped. Uh, we've had a, a visually impaired rider stand up at one of our early rider driver meetups and say it makes all the difference for him to be able to specify in his request that he's visually impaired, he has a service animal, whereas with Lyft, maybe they changed it in the last few years, but he couldn't specify that. And so he would face the, the, the possibility of a Lyft driver pulling up, not wanting a dog in the car and pulling off. He doesn't have to face that with Arcade because people are able to accept him on terms that he can set. So I would say there's all sorts of examples of where our service model is a dramatic improvement over Urban Lyft. And just by the fact that we are able to participate and compete globally that's, that's more than enough to establish like a successful business. And once we, you know, get, get some more real funding and revenue flowing, I think we'll be able to bulk out our operation and start to compete more head to head, uh, with, with Uber. And, and look, one of my goals is pushing them out of Austin entirely. So <laughs> we'll see. That's fascinating. I mean, cause, cause in my, my experience, you know, I'm living in a city, I, I think Uber and Lyft are everywhere. And when you, when you say this, I go, you know, you're right. There's a lot of instances where it doesn't work. It, it may only be useful in cities today. There are restrictions. There are, you know, top-down controls set by those, those two platforms. And I, I do see this. There is an opportunity. It seems like we can unlock a next level of ride sharing. I want to learn more about the roadmap for you guys to unlocking that and what, what your steps are along the way for getting people paying with Lightning, getting people onboarded, getting people sending messages on Noster. What does that process look like in the next like six, 12 months? Sure. So the, the main name of the game for us now is putting out a mobile app and iterating it as much as needed till we get product market fit. And we'll sort of know it when we get there, when there's a bunch of inbound interest. Like right now, there's a lot of people like loving the fact that we're doing lightning and helping to, you know, kind of test and kick the tires. But um, this has to be useful for the driver who wants to make a living. It has to be useful for the rider who wants a ride home. Um, and so the name of the game for us is, is finding, you know, markets or, or 
not even markets, but just people for whom when there's the arcade product that they, that they install and use makes a massive difference for them. Um, we're happy to use um, our, our Austin network as sort of uh, beta testing, but we're, we're kind of going to be basing our launch plans on where there is the most um, inbound demand. Um, the largest inbound demand by far has been Brazil. Uh, and they've got all sorts of, you know, interesting, um, uh, you know, large country of 200 million people. Um, uh, interestingly, ride sharing is, is still a massive growth industry uh, in, in Latin America and um, uh, Southeast Asia. Brazil is Uber's number two country by volume behind the U.S. Sao Paulo uh, is their number one city by volume uh, as well. Brazil has uh, historically a strong tradition of cooperatives. Uh, and so there's like a real familiarity with that, which is sort of unique to our model. Um, and then you've got areas like, you know, the middle of the Amazon uh, or, or, you know, er, er, there's all sorts of areas around Brazil, again, where Uber is, is underserved. Uh, and so we, we've made a point to translate our mobile app into Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, the app right now is about kind of 80% translated into both of those. Uh, but we're, we're launching with, with, you know, next month with, with support for these three languages. Uh, I think Latin America is going to be our, our, our biggest growth area. Um, you know, we don't yet know how to model um, kind of what we as a, a company that intends to make money can sort of benefit from lightning transactions. Can't model that. We can model, um, you know, taking a, a fair percentage on in-app credit card transactions. So we have an integration with Stripe. Um, we are going to be and I'm excited to see kind of what the usage patterns look like offering these two side by side and setting the percentages such that if a driver, for example, has an option of keeping 85% of a credit card transaction or 99% of a lightning transaction, um, hopefully that incentivizes drivers to then become their own sort of salespeople for, oh, you're not on Bitcoin yet? Let me help set you up with that. Um, love this idea of, of sort of drivers or service providers as mobile sales people. Uh, I was in a Uber in New York a few months ago, and uh, the driver uh, handed me this card for this like premium olive oil that his friend sells. And I just had I was like, "Are you getting commission for this? Like, you should get commission for this." And just, there's a, there's a <laughs> It's, it's, a, it's a huge opportunity to have a driver in, the, you know, in a trusted relationship with a captive audience. Uh, uh, the potential there for Bitcoin adoption, if we can kind of gamify it, make it fun, give the driver an incentive. Uh, well, one thing I'm really excited about is, is our you know, somewhat standard uh, referral commission based uh, uh, re referral program. And we're not the only um, you know, Bitcoin company to offer this. Basically, if you sign someone up, you can get 1% of their in-app transactions. Um, but I've had drivers tell me <laughs> over the years that, you know, one, one driver in Hawaii, for example, he said, when you get that 1% referral thing solid, uh, I will go and sign up every Uber driver in Hawaii, and then I will travel the world signing up drivers for you. Uh, and you know, we, 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 I'm, I'm excited about this idea of, um, of having drivers sort of graduate from being drivers to being more organizers if they're helping to build their network, particularly if they're taking a leading role in building their own local network or what we call guilds, um, basically doing the same kinds of things that otherwise a corporate city office like Uber's would do, like what our Austin network has done, um, doing handling all this driver vetting and rider complaints and all sorts of things themselves. I think they should be paid for what they're doing. It's amazing that they're doing it on sort of a volunteer basis because they have an incentive to keep the network going, but I want to see them paid to do this. Um, and one of the amazing things about Lightning is that it makes kind of revenue share splits really easy. And so you can imagine a guild that says, look, we're going to be, um, you know, taking a 2% um, into the guild treasury. 1% is going to go here. 1% is going to go there. And we're still dramatically outperforming the, you know, Uber. They take sometimes 25 or 30% per ride. And, and, and that was back when you could actually tell consistently Sometimes it's way more than that they take. It's completely disconnected. They've got all their algorithm stuff and, and this lack of transparency really pisses drivers off. Um, so I, I think the once we get certain of these processes solid where we're able to provide a UI UX that is similar to what it, you know, people expect from Uber and Lyft, 
that sort of incentivizes people to kind of build up their local networks. I think you know it, it's going to be a little bit tricky getting past the the kind of chicken and egg problem of look, how do you build up a two sided marketplace, particularly on a, a you know, relatively low budget. One thing that we've noticed so far is that when you properly incentivize drivers, particularly with our Austin network as the best example, that look, here's a way for you to build your own recurring customer base, make more money in a way that's truly on your own terms. Um, uh, I, I think the network is going to grow, grow, grow pretty fast. Our, our objective is to um, grow sustainably. It's to um, generate revenue. We've got like a really low burn operation. Like we, we don't have much of a budget now. But look, we've raised and spent a few hundred thousand dollars over the years building out an absolutely gorgeous mobile app. I'm able to go in and kind of connect it to Lightning as is needed. And so when we put this out, if we're able to say, look. We're going to take the drivers that we've talked to have been comfortable with us taking 10% on in-app credit card transactions. Say, look, we're going to take 10% on in-app credit card transactions. We're going to take 1% on in-app lightning transactions. And you always have the option of transacting 100% peer-to-peer if you want to. Uh, I think that's enough to kind of like get us really going and have have some of these networks start to form. And um, past that, we'll see. And it's hard to predict because no one's ever done this before like we're doing. So... We'll see. Stay tuned. <laughs> I, I see this as a sustainable revenue stream on the credit card side and the lightning side. I like that you can opt out and say, hey, I'm just going to continue doing peer to peer stuff over time. And I, I'm going to build this like customer base and, and that'll be my my base that I use and, uh, you know, never have to then interface with any company and you can just directly go to your customers. I really like that. Is that is that going to be a sustainable? Do you think those two, the the fees on credit cards and the fees on Lightning payments, will provide enough funding for the company to allow it to expand globally? Do you think these scale up over time and basically people will yeah. choose to yeah, use these so. versus versus uh, individual peer to peer payments? Yeah. So for for example. Um, we launched in the Philippines in 2017, 2018. We kind of took advantage of a similar situation. Uber got suspended for a couple weeks, and so the, the, the press was talking about it. We spent about $5,000 on a press release and some Facebook ads. Um, we built a massive network. We got about like 20,000 signups in a couple of weeks. Um, I got on CNN Philippines on a live televised panel, like arguing with the head of the Philippine national transportation regulator. We just got like so much demand, it, it dramatically overwhelmed us. And unfortunately we weren't able to like kind of monetize that, but we're absolutely able to see that um, you, you don't need a lot of capital to launch, at least with the model that we have. It's just sort of like interesting enough. And we're able to, thanks to our model, which is more flexible, uh, than Uber and Lyfts, it, it, we're able to offer like really clear contrast where there's enough curiosity that it's like, I think all we really need to do is provide a really clear kind of ladder for how like person number one in their network who has the motive to, whether it's print up business cards or do the equivalent of, hey, here's my custom branded arcade sign up page because I'm building Arcade City, Manaus, Brazil, um, you know, get the first few people involved, get a few success stories um, and you know one thing that we've seen is like if you start a network you know I say on average like our, our Austin drivers you know it, it, it depends on the level because some are part-time some are full-time but I say two to three times the money that they they can make compared to Uber and Lyft well the guy who started that Iowa network he reported at the height of that he was making five times the money um, so it's just like if we can get from one person to a few people making way better money than Uber or Lyft. Word gets out, network starts building. Um, the, 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 the network in Austin, we, it's hard to know exactly, but we've calculated it's done probably about 500,000 rides with 100 drivers on a, on a budget of, of essentially nothing. We, we don't spend anything to maintain that. Um, and so I think that if we can multiply that model of creating these teams of drivers, you know, a few hundred thousand rides here, there, and everywhere per year, um, just able to do that on a, on a, on a, a kind of a bootstrap budget. I would say fundamentally there's, the, there's a larger narrative about, you know, people seem to think that Uber and Lyft are these like 
you know, I mean, they're, they're definitely dominant players, but if you look at their, <laughs> their, their, their financials and the performance of their stock and the dramatically unsustainable unit economics that they have, I think if there's any real competitor that's able to compete with sustainable unit economics, I think they're fucked. Um, and, and some people kind of like, you know, are, well, skepticism is always great. But people sometimes don't like that I, I, I talk shit as much as I do about Uber and Lyft. But I, I, I really think we have the power to supplant them. And it's, it's, it's not even so much about like the specific technology that we're using because a competitor can always adopt your technology. I think the magic is around network structure. Uh, and so one thing that we kind of studied and, and kind of like viewed through some of the you know, intellectual lens, reading some of these like academic reports that have been written about um, our Austin network and, you know, doing some research, realizing that, you know, people talk a lot about peer-to-peer -peer networks and they're all excited about peer-to-peer -peer networks. Well, peer-to-peer -peer networks are actually not the most advanced type of network. Um, there's a, so people cite Metcalf's law around peer-to-peer -peer network. Well, there was a, um, a, another academic in the last few years, David Reed, um, he put forward this theory called the law of group forming networks. And I would encourage people to Google this because this is, I think is actually quite relevant also to Bitcoin adoption. Um, and, and Reed's point is that if, according to Metcalf's law, the value of a peer-to-peer -peer network, like the abstract kind of network value of a peer-to-peer -peer network is n squared, where n is the number of nodes, contrasted with like a, a hierarchical organization where the network value was closer to n. So hierarchical organization, n, peer-to-peer -peer network, n squared. He says that the highest form of network is actually a group forming network, which is when you start with a peer-to-peer -peer network. So you start with everyone can connect peer-to-peer -peer however they want, but it has the added property of making it as easy as possible for groups to form. So for individuals to join or leave groups. So that the value of a group forming network is as high as two to the nth power. Now, where are Uber and Lyft on that scale? I would say that they're somewhere between hierarchical and peer to peer. They're definitely not peer to peer. But I would put the network value of Uber and Lyft at somewhere between n and n squared. And I would say that when you look forward five years and you think about Arcade City as one participant in a global network anchored to Bitcoin with shared social layers, shared service layers in which we've carved out for ourselves some sort of niche providing certain experience for rideshare delivery and other gig services, I would say that that network is going to have a network value of somewhere between n squared and 2 to the nth power. And if you're talking about, let's say, a million people, the difference between n squared and 2 to the nth power is a lot. So I think collectively, we as Bitcoin, and I don't see this, this coalescence happening on, on other chains that are focused on, on you know, the shit coinery. I think it's going to happen on Bitcoin. And I think that, that we building Bitcoin Uber as a team effort, we're going to knock Uber on their ass. And if we can, if we can push Uber on their ass, Uber, which has had so much success bullying governments, I mean, it's going to get really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> that, that is an interesting way of framing the different networks and how they might form. Um, one thing I want to touch on is, you know, Uber has historically been a big capital consumer. They just eat up money and they blow it all on, you know, marketing and trying to, trying to grow their user base, uh, hoping to build up a network effect and then extract value from it. How do, you, how do you compete with them in a capital light manner without the billions of dollars they have? Is it because word of mouth marketing is able to uh, replace the kind of like paid ad spend that they're doing? What, what's the biggest like hole or money sink for them that you guys will not have? So, so part of it is um, Uber and Lyft have massive um, uh, driver turnover and our numbers are the exact inverse of theirs. So for example, um, and, and people have not been able to come up with an exactly accurate number because <laughs> they don't want to share this information, but there, there have been some serious ride sharing analysts who have analyzed 
what they can of what's public and interviews and such from Uber and Lyft. And they said their annual driver turnover rate is somewhere between 50 and 90 percent. Right. So and, and we all know that Uber and Lyft have high driver churn. So let's just say it's somewhere between 50 and 90 percent. Can you guess what our churn number annually is in Arcade City, Austin? It's 8 percent. Half of that is just people kind of deciding to do other things. But for the people that want to be participating as drivers, if you give them a way to do that in integrity, to be entrepreneur, to basically deliver on the promises of Uber and Lyft, be your own boss. We actually were the only people actually enabling that. Um, the, the retention is, is, is insane. I already mentioned the driver earnings piece and the cost efficiency to us as a company I mean, you know, we spent some percentage of, of a, a hundred grand seed investment launching the Austin network and we spent some money in that in that first, you know, nine month period or so. But but since then, the, the annual expenditure to keep this, you know, this this network going is me taking the driver leaders out to dinner once a year. Um, and if you look at the numbers of what it produces um, and again, we don't have firm numbers, but we've estimated that somewhere between. Eight to 10,000 rides per month are done by this network of 100 to 150 drivers. Um, average transaction size of 20 to 25 dollars. Um, you're talking about two ish, one to two million dollars per year in peer to peer bookings revenue. Now, if you're talking about a company, if we're saying, look, we're going to take 10% on rides paid through the app. And all, all of that transactions thus far have been peer to peer. We haven't got anything from that, but everyone is comfortable with the 10% number. If for every 100 drivers, 150 drivers uh, in a given year, we're, we're taking 100 grand, I mean, that, those numbers work out really freaking great. Um, we don't need to do, and like, you know, we'll, we'll need to bulk up and build a team and, and, and there will need to be more done. But, but the name of the game uh, and the, the bet that we're making is that by continuing to empower the edges of networks, like, like how you build a peer-to-peer -peer network is you empower the edges of the networks, like the, the individuals with as much agency as mm -hmm. possible. So everything that we can do around decentralizing, decision-making of rides, you know, like terms of the ride, like if I'm gonna take you, how much I'm gonna charge you, empowering individuals with as much agency as possible. And then kind of the, the thing that not many people when they talk about decentralized rideshare think about is to provide some level of agency collectively or to like the level of the guild where people can, you know, the guild is empowered to make their own decisions about driver vetting and people can choose to transact with them uh, whether they, or not they want. Um, I think that when we're able to, um, you know, have a, I mean, all, all of the success that we've had in our Austin network has been from basically one guild, but let's imagine that there's a competitive marketplace of these guilds that, maybe differentiate themselves on we have a certain Bitcoin treasury with certain referral program things or we specialize in a certain type of service or we specialize in people that are completely new and we, we give free rides to our certain customers. We have drivers in Austin that will give rides on credit. Some people will post and be like, I don't get my paycheck till Friday. Can I give ride? Like, and some drivers, they decide to do that. Like there's levels of service that are possible that when you give people at the level of like the individual the power to be truly entrepreneurial and to give them a support structure, um, you know that's community driven. Uh, I, I think that that's a magic formula. I, I want to say lastly, there, there's only two projects that I'm aware of that are actually doing anything meaningful in terms of providing actual service being sort of decentralized. Um, it's Arcade City, and there's a project called Eva, uh, based I think in Montreal. And, um, you know, they have some like nominal integration with the EOS chain. I haven't looked at it in like a year, but um, they got some press coverage. They built a network in Montreal somewhat similar to what we built in Austin, you know, with ambitions of going global and stuff. Their model's a bit different than ours. But like, it's, it's pretty telling that of all of the people that have talked about building decentralized rideshare, the only two projects that you can mention both have one important thing in common an emphasis on cooperatives. They also have, they call it a cooperative. They want to build cooperatives. So it, it, it's really like, I want, I want to see a network of these Bitcoin powered cooperatives able to set their own rules and be able to, you know, have lightning payments go 
uh, be routed however they want, but but to do it not in a way that's top down, but but um, you know, kind of as as grassroots as possible. And look, this is a massive fucking thing that we're not going to be able to do all of by ourselves. It's in part why we've you know recently made the decision to push all our code into the public domain. We're starting to you know get some more people wanting to contribute in a more open way and, and help turn this into a protocol. Um, so it, it's, it's going to be a team effort, but I'm, I'm insanely bullish on, on the opportunity generally. Yeah, I'm really excited. This, this conversation has been illuminating for me. I, I didn't recognize all the, all the interesting stuff that you're working on, all the opportunities that are available. So I'm really glad we got to do this discussion. Um, at the end of every show, I do something called the lightning round for some rapid fire questions. Are you ready for the lightning round? Yes. Welcome to the lightning round presented by Zebedee, your portal into the world of Bitcoin gaming. The Zebedee app offers a full-featured Lightning wallet seamlessly integrated with your own personal gamer tag so that you can earn Bitcoin on all of Zebedee's games on mobile and desktop. It's never been more fun to earn Bitcoin and Zebedee is your key to it all. To claim your personal gamer tag and start earning some Bitcoin of your own, download the Zebedee app today. All right. Uh, In the year 2030, what will be the largest market for Arcade City? Largest market will be powering uh, infrastructure for one million startup society, like like micro cities. Okay, that's a that's an interesting answer. I like arcade it. City, not by the it's not Arcade Rise, it's Arcade City. There's you can have me back for part two. I'll go into more of that plan. <laughs> okay. All right. What percentage of payments, again, in 2030, what percentage of payments will be credit card payments and what percentage will be lightning payments? 2030. Um, well, I'm a fan of the 80-20 principle. Let's, let's say uh, 20% lightning and then uh, 80% fiat and then 10 years after that, we'll flip it the other way. Interesting. Um, if you could change one thing about Bitcoin, what would you change? Um, we need more toxic maximalists. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Um, if you had one book that you were to recommend a listener on this conversation uh, reads, what's that book? Swarmwise. Uh, subtitled The Tactical Manual to Changing the World. Uh, actually, the author, Rick Falkfinger, sent our Austin network a box of them um, early on. We've used it as sort of our operating manual. It's basically how you build a what he calls swarm organization or like a grassroots organization um, in a way that can just beat the crap out of um, entrenched uh, 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 you know, established corporations or governments or whatever, political parties. And uh, it's, it's been a real source of ideas and inspiration for us. And, and I, I hope to have more people familiar with its tactics and, uh, you know, help contribute some of those, those thoughts to Arcade City. Interesting. I haven't heard of that one, but I appreciate the recommendation. Um, final question. Uh, Michael Saylor likes to say that Bitcoin is hope. What are you hopeful for when you think about the impact Bitcoin could have on the world? Um, I'm hopeful that Bitcoin can serve as a foundation of integrity, that all human systems can be rebuilt on top of, in layers, or anchored to Bitcoin in in the right ways. Uh, And and sort of like delivering on the initial line of, of, you know, shit coiners talking about applying the the technology behind Bitcoin to all other things. Doing that for real, but on a foundation that kind of rules out, you know, the Ponzi-nomics and, and Cantillian effect of, of so much of fiat society. Um, just, yeah, a, a stable basis for, for civilization 2.0. I like it. Uh, where can people go to learn more about you and the work you're doing? Uh, best thing is follow us on Twitter at Arcade City Hall. We're tweeting every day about, like, you know, can follow uh, app updates and stuff. We're constantly releasing new beta builds about once per week. Um, and then you can sign up also on our, our email list on our website, arcade.city. But uh, Twitter's where most of the action is. Until we move people to the Arcade City app, but uh, 
stay tuned in a few months for that. Thanks so much for taking the time. This was a great conversation and I uh, hope we can do it again sometime soon. Absolutely. Kevin, thank you so much. In the last seven days, you guys have sent in 6,285 sats. That came in from 26 different supporters. Uh, let's run through the top five supporters of the last week. We have Renee Aaron who sent in 3,169 sats. Brian of London sent in 648 sats. Ellen Plus sent in 365. Boomi sent in 360. And Turla sent in 345 sats. Thank you to everyone who's contributing to the show. It means a lot to me. Uh, and I'm excited to see what you guys send in from this episode. We had just one additional comment in the last couple of days. We published the last episode two days ago. Uh, and it was a comment in another language uh, in response to episode 62. I can't quite read it, uh, but if you guys can see it publicly on Fountain or your favorite podcast and 2.0 app, uh, maybe someone can help me out. Let me know what the comment says. Either way, excited to see what you guys send in this week. We'll have lots more episodes coming up soon.